Hello and welcome. My name is Jeremy Glover and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our latest Fenwick Elliott webinar, our final one for 2020. And we have, as you would have expect, um, saved the best for last. And so this morning I'm joined by two of my colleagues, partner Claire King and senior associate Rebecca Arder. You may recall that back in July they discussed notices in the condition precedent. And you can, of course, catch up with that and our other previous webinars at your leisure on our YouTube site. Today, they're looking at NEC target cost contracts and we'll be discussing some of the issues that they have come across over the past few months. Having worked with both of them, I know they're perfect place to provide some excellent practical advice on the topic. Before I pass you over, please remember that you are on mute and if, I have any question, if you have any questions, please feel free to write your question in the question box. As always, all questions will be dealt with anonymously. I should also say that we'll provide you all with a link to the slides later. So Claire, Rebecca, I leave the stage to you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. So um, what are we going to cover today? Well, first, we're going to look at what is an NEC3 option C target cost contract and um, explore the philosophy behind it. How does the contract encourage the effective management of risk? And how do you work out what the contractor gets paid? Obviously, an important factor at the end of the job. Um, Second, we're going to look at common disputes on the NEC3 option C target cost contracts. Um, we are seeing these issues a lot at the moment in adjudications. Um, so these are things to be aware of when you're setting up your contracts or things to steer around and avoid, ideally, during a job if it is still going on. So we will be looking at defined costs, disallowed costs, compensation events, and then at the end, we're going to look at something that we're finding is particularly topical at the moment in light of recent case law, but also the economic climate. And that is omissions and termination for convenience. Um, but first, Rebecca is going to look at NEC option C objectives and how those can sometimes compare to the reality. Thank you, Claire. So when you look at the objectives of the NEC suite, as well as of the target cost contracts more specifically, it is easy to see why they are appealing to both contractors and employers. Essentially, the objectives here, as set out on the slide, are to allow both parties to the contract to take a proactive approach to the project, allowing any issues to be identified quickly and addressed during the course of the project rather than at the end. So the aim is to represent a more collaborative approach than the traditional, say, JCT-style JCT contract with the overall goal of reducing risk in the project. When it comes to Option C target cost contracts, parties have the opportunity to have the best of this NEC world with those objectives we just talked about, even in cases where the work to be done is not yet fully defined or for some reason there are higher risks than usual. Under the cost target cost contracts, these cost risks are shared by the contractor and the employer, which again encourages collaboration and efficiency. This does require the project manager and the contractor to understand the contract completely, as the contract is almost entirely prescript prescriptive when it comes to common issues such as compensation events, disallowed costs and so on, as well as keeping constant communication with each other and aim to have the overall collaboration that the NEC suite is about. When all of these things come together, the parties will have shared the risk of a project that the contractor has also been incentivised to complete as time and cost efficiently as possible. It's an absolute win-win for employers and contractors, so why are we here? Where is the issue? Unfortunately, once the human element is taken into account, the reality of these contracts can be much different from those intended objectives. Disagreement throughout the project when it comes to things such as accepted programs and compensation events and disallowed costs can lead to disputes at the end of the project. All of this is also not assisted by a lack of judicial guidance on the interpretation and application of the provisions of these contracts. Ourselves, we have noticed more disputes in relation to NEC, particularly these target cost contracts than ever before in our recent experience. So we think it is something that we do need to talk about. Um, notably, it is also still common to have final account disputes or negotiations at the end of a project, which is something that NEC had intended to avoid. <laughs> 
We'll run through all of these issues in more detail later, but for now, how do these contracts operate? As we've mentioned, the Option C target cost contracts ensure that employers and contractors share the risk of a project. This is done by setting a target price. And when I say target price, please take it that I'm referring to what in the contract is defined as the prices. That can just become a little bit confusing when I'm mentioning the word prices a lot. So for the purpose of this webinar, I will be saying target price. But if you're looking in the contract, you're looking for the prices. The target price is the price that the contractor thinks will cover the cost and profit required for the contractor to take on the work while still being competitive enough to win the tender. Under the NEC3 form, these are comprised of an estimate of defined costs plus a fee. The fee represents the contractor's overheads, costs, profits, that sort of thing. And the estimate of the defined costs consists of lump sum prices for activities on the activity schedule. So in all, the aim of the target price is to accurately reflect the anticipated cost of the works if all things were to go to plan. However, the contractor also needs to take into account that they're really looking to try to maximise their gain at the end, which means they want to make sure they're going to come in under that target price. I'll talk about this in more detail soon. During the course of the works, the contractor will be paid for the price of the works done to date which consists of the defined costs minus any disallowed costs plus the fee at a certain period of time. The defined costs that comprise the price for works done to date are the actual costs incurred by the contractor. These are assessed by the project manager during the course of the project <clears throat> with reference to the contractor's accounts and records. So it is important that these accounts and records are comprehensive and they're kept up to date, which is something that Claire will talk about in more detail soon. The price for works done to date will obviously increase as the project goes on and the contractor incurs more cost. At the end of the project, if the price for works done to date is more than the target price, so the contractor has underestimated the target price and the cost of the works has exceeded what was planned for, then the difference between the price for works done to date and target price is known as the pain share. If the price for works done to date is less than the target price, and the contractor has performed the works at a cost saving, then the difference between the price for works done to date and the target price is known as the gain share. Um, my attempt to portray this visually is set out on the slide for you in case, in case that's helpful at all. In either case, the pain share or the gain share are to be shared between the employer and the contract at an agreed level, which means that both parties have the incentive to ensure that the works are performed as efficiently as possible is the overall goal of these contracts is to make sure that you come away with a gain share. Now the target price itself can be adjusted during the course of the works for compensation events and in some cases inflation which needs to be accepted as an option. So clearly one of the most important elements of an NEC3 option C target cost contract is being able to identify what comprises a defined cost and what will be a disallowed cost during the course of the project. So I'll hand over to Claire now to talk about defined costs in a bit more detail. Thank you, Rebecca. So common disputes, sorry, just going backwards a bit. Common disputes on these type of contracts that we see. Turning first to defined costs. Now that's broadly defined and it's divided into two parts. So the first part is amounts due to subcontractors, which we'll take a little bit to look at later. And then the cost of components in the schedule of cost components, people, equipment, plant materials, charges, manufacture, fabrication, and design and insurance are all subject to a set of rules. And that sets out in the, it's set out in the SCC, what constitutes defined costs. And you need to make sure that your costs fall within those. Then you take off disallowed costs, which Rebecca will look at later. And when you're looking at defined costs, clause 52.1 is really important to have in mind. All the contractor's costs which are not included in the defined costs, and again, hark back to the SCC, which is really important for setting the rules 
um, for direct costs are treated as included in the fee. So you need to check, and you should be checking at the beginning of the job, ideally before you even sign the contract, whether everything you need is added into that if it doesn't fall somewhere else. Um, otherwise, it's deemed included in the fee, and if, if you haven't thought about it, your fee may not be adequate. So, turning to the schedule of cost components, I'm just going to focus in on a few issues that we see in disputes um, regularly um, to highlight things that you want to think about when setting up your contracts or managing your jobs. So, working areas. Working areas is crucial for people costs and it's the key to getting paid. Have you defined the working areas adequately for your job? Um, where is your site perimeter? Um, and does anyone working on your job who you think is going to form part of your people costs and your defined costs falling outside that working area? And this happens far too many times. Um, far more times than it should be should happen so for example if, if there's a minibus driver on the edge of your site who ferries people to and from um a collection point or, or a ferry terminal is he covered or is he going to be formed part of the fee have you thought about where he where he fits um are there any traveling um people other than designers who fall into a different category Maybe you need to include other offices spread around the country because you don't think it's going to fit into the fee if you haven't included the working areas more broadly or defined them. So there are just some issues to think about at the beginning because we do see disputes on this point a lot and costs can wrap up quite quickly for those for, for long term contracts. Um, how do you prove somebody is in the work was in the working areas that day, maybe two years ago? Memories are not that good. Um, think about how you can establish this in retrospect. Say you get an audit that you're not expecting right at the end of the job, uh, everything's being paid to date and they're seeking um, lots of disallowed costs to be knocked off. Turnstar records, that's fine. Who controls those records? Will you have access to them perhaps um, after the works are finished? Are you keeping copies of those turnstile records as applicable? Um, what happens if the turn cell breaks down or the, or the access, the, the record monitoring breaks down in some way? Um, is there a replacement for that? Um, it may be paper records for a month. Are you going to keep those paper records somewhere safely? Please don't put them in a bin um, because then you have no evidence necessarily and you have to trawl through emails and all sorts of different records to try and, and recover those costs if things haven't gone to plan and you are having a final account dispute down the line. So just things to think about. Um, double check you are happy with any amendments that um, somebody is proposing. Holiday and sickness pay are in the SCC and ditto severance, but they can be crossed out and they are crossed out a lot. Think about the consequences of that in terms of your rates and things like that. Severance is particularly important at the moment. Is it a long term contract? And we'll look a bit at emissions clauses later on and the right to terminate convenience. Um, you want to make sure that if that happens to you, you're covered. And you can do that both in the emissions right to terminate, but the SEC may be a way of helping on that as well. Um, if there are any bespoke amendments for rates, how are you describing people's jobs descriptions in that schedule of rates? Does how you are describing people on the job match the schedule of rates? Um, has anybody changed their role during the project or is about to? Are they being promoted to a different role or changed? This causes a lot of disputes as well as, as people sort of retrospectively say, well, we're not paying that higher rate for so and so because they started on this. Again, you ideally want to flag this, make sure the job, new job description fits with the schedule of rates, get buy into that promotion, get buy into that role change, get it clear and in writing and keep it. Um, because it, again, down the line, it can be hard to find these sorts of records. Sorry, amounts due to subcontractors. Um, obviously, the definition of, of, of that is set out below. Um, Rebecca is going to cover the issue of defects in particular detail later. Um, again, you need to check that um, there's no duplication in the cost you're putting forward. So some certain types of equipment, supplies and services will be included in an overhead cost for the working areas. So you need to make sure that you're not 
duplicating somehow for those costs in the subcontract payments you're trying to get paid up the line. Check your procurement processes. Clause 52.1, and the and which talks about defined costs, includes um, only rates and percentages specified in the contract data or other amounts at open market and competitively tendered prices. And again, we see disputes about this down the line, particularly related to, to CE sometimes, which is a bit um, peculiar when, you, you know, if it's a, it's a standard variation on job, you can't necessarily go out and procure a whole new contractor to, to carry out those works. It doesn't really make sense, but we see those sorts of arguments made. How do you prove that the rates um, subcontractors are putting forward are open market competitively tendered you need to have records of your procurement processes, have everything recorded so it can be verified later down the line. Again, if you're facing an audit at the end of the job where memories aren't too fresh, um, EAs may have changed, um, people you're working with may have changed. It's just things to think about. So, record keeping for defined cost. And I, I should say this is obviously inextricably linked to disallowed costs because if you haven't kept records for your defined costs, um, the risk is they will be disallowed. So record keeping, you cannot keep enough records for this sort of contract and you cannot keep them long enough. Um, always assume you may be audited after the job and the works is completed. Um, and just sort of think about how you would go about evidencing a cost, say, I don't know, two years down the line, memories change, people on the project change, especially on long term projects. And you need to make sure that anything decided on is recorded in writing um, and you've got a record of that and you keep it. Um, so clause 52.2 provides that the following records must be kept. Accounts of payment of defined costs, proof that payments have been made. So you may need to give visibility of your um, payments, so that may, meet, may mean bank records, access to coins, um, audits of coins, all sorts of things you may need to think of and maybe proactively offer during the job to avoid problems later. Communications about and assessments of compensation events for subcontractors, so you need a detailed record of what you've agreed with your subcontractors, how you've managed that process, um, and any other records stated in the works information that contract specific. The other right is the right of inspection um, of accounts and records that the project manager is um, allowed. And I mean, this is in with, within working hours <laughs> and you hope that people are going to um, be sensible about this. But again, we, we see disputes on this, but just bear in mind, they do have a right to inspect at any time within working hours, accounts and records of what you are required to keep. So you need to keep them up to date on a rolling basis. Um, Think about actively inviting detailed inspections throughout the works. It, it, you know, if you tie people into agreeing that this cost is all defined cost, there's no, no elements that are disallowed, you are proactively dealing with disputes that could other ha otherwise happen down the line and you will know there are problems and you can address them proactively. Um, and then make sure your records are airtight to avoid these problems later down the line. So handing over to Rebecca again on disallowed costs. Thank you, Claire. Um, so as Claire mentioned, the biggest catch-all of disallowed costs is anything that cannot be substantiated as a defined cost, which is clearly a very controversial area if a contractor has incurred a cost that they want to be reimbursed for under the contract and the project manager is claiming that it cannot be substantiated as a defined cost. So. As Claire said, those records are absolutely key when it comes to both defined costs and disallowed costs. The project manager is responsible for assessing disallowed costs and must give a reason for each disallowed cost through the certification process. This reason must be specific, not general, and it, um, the reasons provided for in the contract are under clause 11.225. They're appearing on your screen in the slide. Um, the any reason for claiming that a cost is a disallowed cost must refer back to specifically to one of these listed disallowed costs within the contract. They cannot be simply costs that the employer would prefer not to pay, not to pay. It's it's not an opportunity for the project manager to look at issues such as efficiency, reasonableness of costs, comparative market rates, only issues that appear specifically listed within the contract. 
Despite this, it is still one of the most confusing issues for users and results in a significant number of questions to the users group helpline. So it's important to remember that the purpose of a target, target cost contract is to ensure that the contractor is reimbursed for the cost spent undertaking the works. Any overspend or inefficiency with this cost allocation is intended to be dealt with by the pain share. It is not intended to be dealt with by disallowing a cost on the basis of reasonableness. Some of the disallowed costs provided for in the contract are fairly clear and straightforward. So for example, resources not used to provide the works. This could, in, could include uh, equipment remaining on site, even where it's no longer required, or payment for materials that were not ultimately used, those sorts of things. Um, however, there are some that are more controversial and, and frankly confusing when it comes to their application. And one of those is the issue of defects. So the correction of defects pre-completion is a reality that projects all unfortunately generally need to accept. One difficulty when it comes to target cost contracts, however, is how are the costs of correcting defects approached? Are they disallowed costs? Generally, in a fixed price contract, a contractor will work an allowance for correction of defects into their pricing. This isn't something that's required in a target cost contract, as a contractor is supposed to be reimbursed for the cost of the works. And at least pre-completion, the cost of correcting defects is considered a defined cost. The only time this will not be the case is if it can be shown that the defect was caused by the contractor not complying with a constraint on how the contractor is to provide the works. This is even the case in other situations where it can be established that the contractor caused the defect or the defect was otherwise associated with some sort of breach of contract. As long as they were operating within the constraints of the contract, then it will be considered a defined cost. This can at the outset seem counterintuitive to employers to pay the cost of correcting defects under a contract, which is why I think probably this is one of the most controversial issues when it comes to defined costs or disallowed costs. However, it's important to keep in mind that with option C target cost contracts, any payment made to the contractor as a defined cost under the price for works done to date increases the amount the contractor has received for the price to works done to date. Therefore, it minimizes any gain and or increases the contractor's likely contribution to the pain share in return. So it does sort of balance itself out for the employer at the end of the project, but only if the employer and project manager keep that bigger picture of mind and the intention of the target price contract. If this were not the case, and if defects pre-completion were a disallowed cost, then it is likely the contractor would need to build some sort of contingency into its target price, possibly through, through its fee structure, which defeats the purpose of the option C contract, which is fair and transparent pricing. If it is really an issue, we have noticed in some cases, particularly on larger projects, that parties, the employer, will um, attempt to amend or add bespoke clauses to their contracts to account for this sort of issue. Uh, for example, they would require that defined costs be something that are reasonably incurred or extend disallowed costs under their contract to include anything associated with a breach of contract. Either of these could arguably mean that correction of defects would fall as a disallowed cost rather than a defined cost. It's important to make sure that you're aware of any sort of amendments that are proposed to these contracts, particularly where they affect disallowed costs, as this could become hugely controversial throughout the course of the project. There is a risk in making these amendments, the most significant being that it does shift the balance of risk within the contract. So it's important to bear in mind that while you may be asking the contractor to pay for correcting the defects now, you're making sure that the price for work done to date has not increased. Therefore, the contractor's potential gain share increases while the employer's decreases. The contractor's incentive for minimising defects throughout the work to gain to, ma to maximise their potential gain share sorry, is also decreased. So you lose that financial incentive for efficiency and accuracy, which is another aim of the target cost contracts. When it comes to correction of defects post-completion, I should add that these will most likely, in most cases, be a disallowed cost. 
It is inevitable that the employer and contractor in the target cost contract will have adverse positions when it comes to disallowed costs. The contractor is seeking to recover all costs incurred, though obviously they are looking to incur these costs as efficiently as possible to maximise their potential gain, while the employer has the task of scrutinising these costs and ensuring it does not pay any more than necessary, which occurs through the process of disallowing costs. Clearly, there are issues that are going to arise as part of this process, what constitutes a disallowed cost and what does not. And it is quite understandable why this is the issue that results in the highest number of questions to the NEC users group in relation to these contracts. The only way to avoid this is to remember why a cost-based contract is being used and what the purpose of it is. The fact that sometimes including costs as defined costs will eventually benefit the employer and being clear about what is included as a defined cost and what is included as a disallowed cost particularly if either party attempts to amend or add bespoke clauses in relation to these issues. When it comes to the assessment of disallowed costs, always keep in mind it can only be disallowed if the contract specifies that it is to be so, not because it appears unreasonable or accounts for inefficiency or otherwise was associated with breach of contract. And the project manager must be able to provide specific reasons that a cost has been classified as a disallowed cost. If a contractor does not agree with the way the cost has been classified, make sure you have the records to establish that it ought to be a defined cost. So that includes both what the cost was, what it was for, and also evidence that that cost or item or material or work was actually provided in application on the works. Because if it was a cost associated with the resource not applied to the works, then it will be a disallowed cost. So you need both the costing information and the justification and evidence as to how it was applied. The contractor should also record any objection to a cost being categorised categorized as a disallowed cost at the earliest opportunity. So with that, I'll hand back to Claire to discuss the one way we can adjust our target price during the course of the project, which is compensation events. Thank you, Rebecca. So, compensation events. So I think pretty much anyone who's familiar with the NEC will know the list of um, compensation events, and there's a summary of, of, of them there. Um, and we'll look at the employer breach of contract in the con context of emissions later on, as that's a very topical um, theme. Um, it's crucial to maintain, to, to maintain, keep on top of adjusting your target and keep on top of the admin, um, as particularly as a contractor. If there has been a compensation event, you obviously need to get your target adjusted to stand a chance of getting your gain share. Um, so if there have been big changes made to the works informations or delays, you need to notify the CEs in accordance with the provisions and agree adjustments to the target as soon as possible. And it, this can be easier said than done, as we'll uh, look at slightly later. Um, but you need sufficient commercial resource on a project like this to get this done. And that can sometimes be very difficult if there are a multitude of design changes, for example, flooding in. Um, we, we see too often sort of people getting overwhelmed by the compensation event possibilities because there's so much happening on the job. So it, it's, it's crucial for these sorts of projects um, to try and keep on top of that process. So assessing CEs, again, just looking at this briefly, um, it's meant to be forward looking. Um, obviously, you've got early warning notices in clause 16. Um, so you give notice if there's anything which may lead to an increase in the prices delay to completion, delay meeting a key date, or impair the performance of the works. And then you've got time bars to encourage the early notification of CEs. And EWNs often need to be followed up by notification of a CE, and very often, well, all too often they're not. So that's something you need to keep on top of as well. And just again, emphasizing clause 61.3, it's forward looking. So there's a dividing line, um, and you're meant to be looking at the the forecast of what's happening rather than looking back at it in retrospect which is what happens all too often and Rebecca again we'll look at that later. Time bars, now I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because Rebecca and I did a talk on conditions precedents and time bars and an in-depth look at the case law which is available on Fennec Elliott's website if you want to have a look at it. Um, but basically, you have to notify within eight weeks of becoming aware of an event or there is no relief. 
who is aware there may be some arguments as to the level on the site hierarchy that needs to be aware about that but getting away with saying the board has to be aware of something before it's notified is, is not going to happen um exception unless the event arises from project manager or supervisor giving an instruction issuing a certificate changing an earlier decision or correcting an assumption um all too often we have to use this exception to the rule um sometimes it, it's not you know it's it, it's not an ideal situation to be arguing that so if in doubt you notify um it's the old adage it's better to regret what you have done than what you haven't um, and again, as we've emphasised in previous talks, be careful of gentlemen's agreements not to notify or to deal with um, time, for example, in the round at a later date. They're often um, sort of oral agreements and, and you struggle to find something sufficiently clear to evidence that agreement at a later date. So handing to Rebecca for accepted programmes. Thank you, Beth. So under clause 31.2, the contractor must submit a first programme to the project manager for acceptance within the time set out in the contract data. Clause 31.2 is specific as to what this programme must contain in order for it to be accepted. The contractor is, however, required to provide revised programmes either at the instruction of the project manager or at the maximum interval set out in the contract data. If the contractor does not do this or the project manager does not accept the programme, then the project will be operating without an accepted programme, which can be disastrous for contractors. Project managers are entitled to make their own assessments under Clause 64.2 if there is no accepted programme. In our experience, project managers use this opportunity to provide their own assessments of value that are, not surprisingly, not aligned with how the contractor would assess this value and is something that contractors should attempt to avoid at all costs. If the project manager rejects the contractor's programme, it must do so within two weeks of submission. If the project manager does not do this within two weeks but also does not accept the programme, then under NEC3 the contractor ought to notify a compensation event to reserve its position. Under NEC4, however, the project manager will be deemed to have accepted the programme if there is no response within two weeks. This is likely in response to the game playing that has been noticed when it comes to project manager assessments that I just talked about. Hopefully, this will assist in ensuring there is an accepted programme for the project in the event that the project manager is attempting to remain silent on the issue by not confirming acceptance but also not going so far as specifically stating that they are rejecting the programme, which under NEC3 will result in there not being an accepted programme for the work. If the project manager rejects the programme, it must be for one of the specific reasons set out in Clause 31.3. Those are appearing on the slide as well. If it is for one of these reasons, then the contractor should correct the issue and resubmit the programme as soon as possible. But if it's not for a listed reason, then the contractor should notify a compensation event again. In this case, we would also recommend that the contractor continue to work off the programme that it submitted and provide frequently updated programmes so that there is a record of the contractor's intended work and valuations, regardless of what the project manager is doing in terms of assessment. We also recommend that the contractor keep thorough records of what work it has performed and the costs of these in case it needs to be assessed as a compensation event retrospectively. I mean, as Claire discussed, these compensation events are intended to be assessed on a forward-looking basis, based off the party's projections and intended spend or contract rates. There is an indication, however, through the Northern Ireland Housing Executive case, that compensation events under NEC contracts could be assessed retrospectively. It is important if this is potentially going to be one of your projects that you ensure that you have sufficient records and documentation to show what actually occurred on site if this is going to be the case for you. In the Northern Ireland Housing Executive case, it was shown that the court will be more minded to consider these records of actual work done and cost incurred than to undertake a hypothetical assessment of how the project may have been conducted while ignoring information that is plainly there. Notably, Danny J went so far as to point out why should I shut my eyes and grope in the dark when the material is available to show what work they actually did and how much it costs them, which makes sense. 
It is important to bear in mind that this is a Northern Irish case and so not binding in England and Wales, but it will be interesting to see how it is treated here. Until we do have that judicial treatment in England and Wales, we anticipate that it will be appealing particularly to adjudicators to rely on this case as a way of justifying using the more objective project records when making assessments than working in the hypothetical. So it is likely that um, these manners of assessing, retrospectively assessing compensation events will be taken up. And it is so important, as we've been harping on about, that you keep as many records as possible, submit all of your revised programs, and keep track of exactly what has been happening so you can rely on this if it is needed after the project. I also note, just for clarity, that the Northern Ireland case was not an option C target cost contract, but I think it makes sense that it would likely be applied the same way, so it is still something that it's important for you to be aware of. I'll now hand back to Claire to discuss omissions and terminations for convenience as well. Thank you, Rebecca. So a quick canter through omissions and terminations for convenience. If my slides behave, yes. So um, omissions, um, there's been a recent case on this is why I'm bringing it up, but also in the current economic climate, it's very topical. Um, there is no right to omit MERCs and give them to third parties unless this is expressly provided for in your contract. Um, if you omit works with the intention of giving works to someone else, that is a breach of contract. And the case on that is Abbey Development Limited. The problem then becomes um, with the NEC specific wording. Um, clause 60.1.18, um, a compensation event, a breach contract is a compensation event. And then clause 63.4, the only rights that you have for a compensation event are changes to the prices, the completion date and key dates, um, and you will be setting those in terms of the contract. So it isn't very helpful if you've had a large chunk of your work submitted and you're you're looking for um, a loss of profit claim. And unfortunately, there's been an unhelpful, unhelpful case, <laughs> depending on which side of the fence you're sitting on, I should add, um, in terms of um, Van Ord and Dragados, which is a Scottish case. So again, it, it's guidance and it probably will be taken into account, um, but it, it's not strictly speaking binding, binding in England and Wales. Um, in that um, case, um, the judge confirmed it was a breach of contract to admit to give works to a third party, but he then went on and assessed it as a compensation event rather than awarding wider damages, which would obviously include your loss of profit, redeployment costs to the extent you don't get them under the contract, etc. Um, and he noted the calculation resulted in a reduction of defined costs, um, reduced rate payable to the subcontract for the work remaining to be done. Um, and this was his rationale. So the use of defined costs is intended to provide an objective method of calculating change that occurs as a consequence of a breach contract in a way that does not leave the contract either better or worse off. Now, I just query if that's actually reality. Um, and that's my personal take on this case, because, you know, where is your profit? Um, and, and you might have incurred some significant costs on, on keeping your staff there to do that work. And you can't just necessarily find something else for them to do the next day. You're still going to have to pay for them. So I don't know if that, if, if that statement is necessarily um, accurate. Um, so is the Scottish case correct? Um, I think it will be followed until, unless until the courts in England and Wales say to the contrary. But there is some, some um, commentary, all of it which I should say predates Van Ord, which suggests that they don't think this exclusion clause would work in an NEC contract. Um, exclusion clauses should be construed strictly against the party relying on them. And as you can see, Keating said that is probably not the effect. Um, the reference to rights in the clause may be construed as being to rights under the contract, a claim to consequential losses under the general law being unaffected. So it will be interesting to see um, how quickly this comes up in the courts of England and Wales, because, um, as I said, emissions seem to be on the up at the moment. And then another thing on the final slide to look out for is terminations for convenience. And again, we're seeing a lot of these happening a lot more than historically was the case. And really, for those people entering into new contracts, it's things to look out for. So if there's a termination for convenience, you get A1, A2 and A4. And A4 is your direct fee percentage applied to the excess of the total of the prices at the contract date over the PWDD. So it covers or should cover theoretically your loss of profit um, elements. 
And the problem is we are seeing this routinely deleted from amounts payable on termination for convenience. And what is the consequence of this? Well, there isn't much consequence for an employer who's terminating for convenience. Um, you don't really get any loss, loss um, profit element if you are a contractor. So just check your terms, see what you're, you're entering into because you don't necessarily think about termination right at the beginning of the job, but it is so important to look at this because they are increasing, um, they are in the NEC, and sometimes I think people are even unaware of that, and it's just something to be really, really careful about. And I think that's the end of it, so I will hand back um, to Jeremy. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much indeed, um, Rebecca and Claire. As I said, lots of practical advice, and all the practical advice has led to lots of questions. So we've just got time for two or three, and if we can't answer your question, we will try and see if we can send you an email later later in the week. Um, but first question, um, how best to approach agreeing the target price between a client and a contractor? Uh, Beck? Um, yeah, it, it's a hard one. I mean, it seems straightforward, the target price, and it is, but there's obviously a fine balance that you have to reach. I think because the, of the way these contracts are set up, it is in both parties' interest to try to make sure there is a gain share at the end to be shared around and also to incentivise the contractor to perform the works as efficiently and accurately as possible. So the target price obviously does need to be realistic, but it's important to make sure that not only in being realistic, it's something the parties are confident the contractor can achieve or even beat um, to, to try to ensure that this uh, gain share is received. Understandably as well, this needs to be balanced with the fact that the contractor wants to be competitive and, and win the tender and, and get the job. But as long as the employer bears in mind that they do still want that gain share there, nothing should be priced too competitively, then hopefully they should be able to agree. I mean, at the end of the day, we find that the issue is really more frequently whether they agree on defined and disallowed costs rather than setting the target in our experience it's not been so much of an issue but keep the bigger picture in mind is what i'd say okay brilliant thank you um i'll try and read this one more carefully um when submitting a compensation event quotation should the contractor take cognizance of the risk allowances within the defined cost forecast current at the dividing date and, ex and an example was given um, in relation to a, a physical conditions compensation event um, is that something you can help with Claire yeah yeah um, I mean the answer is yes um, the, the compensation provisions provide that you're meant to include risk um, if it's got a significant chance of occurring in a compensation event um, so you'd need to make that assessment um, the problem is disagreements occurring between what has a significant chance of occurring um, between the PM um, or the EA and um, the contractor. Um, and you see that coming out of disputes on compensation events and how they're valued. So I think if there's any doubt of the dispute, then put assumptions in there instead that are clear um, so you can come back later and say, well, these assumptions were wrong and try and, and then sort of revisit it as it were. But yes, um, it's theoretically yes hopefully you should be including a risk in there it's just it's just the debate as to whether there's a significant risk of it occurring that can cause issues okay no cool thank you um and i know that um one of the reasons that led to you deciding this was a potentially a good a good topic that might be of interest was that we were seeing a number of adjudications involving nec contracts um and someone's just asked about if you've got any top tips for drafting adjudication provisions to comply with the Housing Grants Act? Um, well, in terms of drafting provisions, in terms of the NEC, um, I suppose my first top tip would be don't necessarily take the ICE as the appointing body. Think about that a bit more carefully um, because um, I think people tend to go for that as a default option on NEC contracts. Um, and a bit of a bugbear of mine. They haven't got a very diverse panel, um, and there aren't that many legally qualified people on there. Um, so you may want a panel that's got maybe a bit more of a mix. Um, it didn't actually. There aren't that many engineers there as well either. It's a bit of a curious panel. So um, it can be good for certain purposes, but just think about it. Don't don't automatically go for the default. 
And then the other thing is NEC, you have to adjudicate before you go to any other resolution under the standard provisions. And sometimes I think it's a good thing to have the option to just go straight to court or straight to arbitration. So aside from anything else, um, you know, sometimes adjudications can be very expensive, but also sometimes, depending on the dispute, there's publicity or the threat of publicity or an airing rather than adjudication can be quite healthy for resolution of certain types of disputes. So to have that option, I think is no bad thing. And I think having to go through adjudication each time um, isn't necessarily always the best thing. Although obviously there are massive advantages to adjudication as well. I'm not, I'm not being anti-adjudication. I just think it's nice to have the option. Yeah, and, and that's right, because some some sometimes people just adjudicate because they think that's the obvious thing to do sometimes the bigger picture it, it's not um but that's been brilliant that's been really helpful um lots of practical advice so thank you both very much for that it's much appreciated and thank you all very much for um listening and submitting all the questions as i said at the beginning um these slides will be available um very shortly and also we'll put a copy of this uh webinar up on the fennec Elliott youtube channel as i said this was our last um webinar for 2020 so i mean eventually 2020 the, the longest year will come to an end um so i wish you all the very best to enjoy the festivities for the end of year and i wish you all very early on uh, a, a much better and happier um 2021 and there we go um we start with our webinars again on the 14th of january um, looking at getting paid in the time of the COVID pandemic. And you'll see that partner Andrew Davis um, is joined by one of our associates, Laura Bowler, and Michael Smith, a barrister from Three Stone Buildings. So once again, thank you all very much for listening. All the best for the end of year celebrations, and we'll see you in 2021. Thank you. Bye-bye.